to have died, people are reported to have died in coordinated attacks on around 50 communities in Plateau State in Barkinladi. These attacks began on the 22nd of June and they lasted until the 24th of June. The majority of the victims were women and children. At one location, 120 were killed as they returned from the funeral of an elderly member of the Church of Christ in Nations. A dawn to dusk curfew was established and as I heard firsthand yesterday from the Honourable Kweyum Rimande Shawulu, a member of the Nigerian Federal House of Representatives, the area remains tense. The most recent episode is shocking, but it's also the latest in an extended pattern of violence that's become all too common across Nigeria, particularly in the Middle Belt and increasingly in some of the more southern states. Last week, Sam Brownback, the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom, was in Nigeria. On one single day during his visit, there were six suicide bombings by Boko Haram, the largest number ever on any single day. And as we will hear later from my noble and courageous friend, Lady Cox, who's personally visited these areas, these attacks have been systematic and go on unabated. Human rights groups like CSW have catalogued every reported attack. While it may not be definitive, the list attempts to provide as comprehensive a record as possible of known attacks and of the death toll in the Middle Belt during the first quarter of this year, underlining the critical need for urgent and effective intervention. I've sent many of these details to ministers, but in the interest of time, I'll give the House just a snapshot from a few days in April of this year. On April the 10th, 10 were killed in Ukum, in Benui State. On April the 10th, 51 were killed in Wukari, Taraba State. On April the 12th, 41 were killed in Ukum, in Benui State. April the 12th, two were killed in Makurdi, in Benui State. And on April the 12th, another 41 were killed in Ukum, in Benui State. The charity, Aid to the Church in Need, on whose board I sit in a pro bono capacity, has also documented appalling acts of violence, which I sent to the government. In April, during early morning mass, militants attacked the parish in Makurdi, killing two priests and 17 members of the congregation. ACN have also highlighted the 15,000 orphans and 5,000 widows in the northeast, an area that's come under repeated attack from Boko Haram. And I'd be grateful when we hear from the noble baroness, the minister, to hear what humanitarian aid we've been able to provide for victims. My Lord CSW report within the first quarter of 2018 Fulani heard a militia perpetrated at least 106 attacks in central Nigeria. The death toll in these four months, purely from herd a militia violence, stands at 1,061. An additional 11 attacks recorded on communities in the south of the country claimed a further 21 lives. One spokesman has said, and I quote, it is purely a religious jihad in disguise. There has certainly been a long history of disputes between nomadic herders and farming communities right across the Sahel over land, grazing and scarce resources. I myself have visited places like Darfur where I've seen that firsthand. And it's true that attacks by herder militia have on occasion led to retaliatory violence as communities conclude they can no longer rely on government for protection or justice. Between January the 1st and May the 1st of this year there were 60 such attacks. However, compared with the recent escalation in attacks by well-armed Fulani herders upon predominantly Christian farming communities, the asymmetry is stark and must be acknowledged by the UK government in their characterisation, their narrative of this violence. My Lords, I ask the Minister, given the escalation, frequency, organisation and asymmetry of Fulani attacks, does she still believe references to farmer herder clashes still suffice? In the face of the violence collected by impartial human rights groups, there's no place here for, as it were, moral equivalence, nor is it sufficient for the government to merely urge all sides to seek dialogue and to avoid violence. I would urge the noble baroness to revisit the narrative, to conduct her own assessment, and to either confirm or dispute the data that I've given to the House already and others I know other noble lords will do the same. Some local observers have gone so far as to describe the rising attacks as a campaign of ethno-religious cleansing. 
armed with sophisticated weaponry, including AK-47s, and in at least one, a rocket launcher and rocket-propelled grenades, the Fulani militia have murdered more men, women, and children in 2015, 16, and 17 than even Boko Haram, destroying, overrunning, and seizing property and land, and displacing tens of thousands of people. This is organized and systematic. We must ask where this group of <laughs> nomadic herdsmen is getting such sophisticated weaponry from. I wonder if the noble baroness has had a chance to look into this, and if not, if she'll give an undertaking to do so. Whilst recognising complex underlying causes of this violence, we must also acknowledge a growing degree of religious motivation behind this violence. The local chapter of the Christian Association of Nigeria recently revealed that herdsmen have destroyed over 500 churches in Benue State alone since 2011. Perhaps the minister could also respond to reports that during many of these well-planned attacks by Fulani militia, their cattle are nowhere in sight, and they're often reported by survivors to have shouted Ali Akbar during those attacks. Perhaps the minister could comment on this undoubtedly sectarian aspect of the escalating violence. Beyond intermittent verbal condemnations, I can't see much practical action that's been taken to end the violence, which has emboldened perpetrators even further. And my laws, moreover, in the light of such an inadequate response thus far, communities will, and indeed already are, beginning to feel they can no longer rely on government for protection or justice, and a few take matters into their own hands. In the words of an Anglican canon in the Middle Belt, and I quote, why do so many security service personnel spend their time guarding our politicians rather than protecting our people? May I also put on record a recent statement to President Buhari issued by the Catholic Bishops' Conference of Nigeria. Amongst other things, the statement said this, since the president who appointed the heads of the nation's security agencies has refused to call them to order, even in the face of the chaos and barbarity into which our country has been plunged, we are left with no choice but to conclude that they are acting on a script that he approves of. If the president cannot keep our country safe, then he automatically loses the trust of the citizens. He should no longer continue to preside over the killing fields and mass graveyards that our country has become. That's a pretty awesome statement from a bishop's conference in a country. But concern about partiality was also raised on the 24th of March by the highly respected former army chief of staff and defense minister, Lieutenant General Theophilus E. Danuma, who stated that the armed forces were, I quote, not neutral, they collude in the ethnic cleansing, his words, of riverine states by the Fulani militia. He insisted that, again, I quote, villagers must defend themselves because depending on the armed forces, will result in them dying one by one. The ethnic cleansing must stop in all the states of Nigeria, otherwise Somalia will be child's play. I'd like to hear, therefore, what practical steps the UK government's taking to work with the government of Nigeria in developing effective solutions to bring an end to this escalating violence. And perhaps the noble baroness can tell us whether there is a strategic plan and what representations have been made directly. Now, I know that solutions are complex, but there's nothing to stop the minister calling on the government of Nigeria to recalibrate security arrangements and resource its forces as a matter of urgency in order to offer sufficient protection to vulnerable communities. My Lords, as I close, I want to thank noble lords who are participating in today's debate and take noble lords back to where I began, to the more than 200 people, mostly women and children, who were killed in sustained attacks on 50 villages by armed Fulani militia just this past weekend. People are dying daily. On June the 18th, in the Daily Telegraph, the Archbishop of Abuja described what he called, I quote, territorial conquest and ethnic cleansing and said, the very survival of our nation is at stake. This alone should serve as a wake up call. Are we to watch one of Africa's greatest countries go the way of Sudan? Will we be indifferent as radical forces sweep across the Sahel seeking to replace diversity and difference with a monochrome ideology that will be imposed with violence on those who refuse to comply. We mustn't wait for a genocide to happen as it did in Rwanda. Ominously, my lords, history could very easily be repeated. My lords, I would like to thank the noble Lord, Lord Alton, for securing, unfortunately, a timely debate and declare an interest as the project director of the Commonwealth